All right, so I think we'll get started. Hello and welcome everyone to Forest Music Presents Adjusting Pre-Made Oboe Reads with Ruth Thurow Burrows. She is a wonderful person He's here at Forest Music. She's our resident oboe expert. Um, she's a very well-known oboist here in the San Francisco Bay Area and we're so pleased to have her here with us today. Um, she'll be kind of walking you through all of the steps to adjusting a read to make sure that it works for you. Tools are encouraged, but not required. Um, if you have questions at all, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, we'll have a big question and answer session at the end, but if there's something burning that's super important, go ahead and toss it in the chat box and either I will keep track of it or um, I will toss them out to Ruth as, as they become um, relevant. Um, Otherwise, Ruth will take questions. Feel free to unmute your mics if you'd like to, to speak, but um, if you're not speaking, we just ask that you um, mute your mic so we can reduce uh, background noise, and I will let Ruth take it from here. Thank you, Ellie. Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be doing this. I actually, Zoom uh, has been a really great thing over this pandemic. I've been able to continue teaching, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm up here on the second floor at Forest Music in lovely Berkeley, California in, um, in my studio. So I'm not in Hawaii, I'm actually here at Forest. Um, and just a little bit about myself, just so you, um, you know, so you know who I am. I have a bachelor's and a master's in music performance. So I've, and I've taken lots of lessons with all sorts of different um, players and performers and that that experience and learning from them has been invaluable. So some of the information that I'm giving to you today has been, you know, just, you know, gathered over many, many years. And I, I have to thank all of the teachers that taught me because, you know, you go here and learn a little bit and grab that little bit of information and you put it all together. And over years and years, you, you know, you improve. <laughs> um, and there's no one way to make reads. Um, and uh, we're talking about adjusting reads today, but I do want you to know that there's lots of ways to get to the end product. And the end product is something that you can play on and relax. I think the most important thing um, with reads is being able to have an open mouth where you can use your air and relax and make music. So just always keep that in the back of your mind that that's what you're trying to do. We get really caught up in adjusting reads and you can go down a rabbit hole and never come out. And you just have to be remind yourself that we're here to play music. I'm sure you've had a read at some point where you, you're exhausted after five minutes. You're like playing on this read and you're like, oh my God, I can't go on. Generally, there's something wrong with that read, unless you're not practicing and you're, these muscles are tired. Um, but I would imagine that's not the case if you play the oboe. You're trying hard and that read is fighting you. And so that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today is how to escape <laughs> that read that's just giving you a hard time. And you can't obviously blame everything on the read, you know, but there's, there are some things that, that you can do. Um, but there's kind of some nuts and bolts that I think we should talk about first. Um, one is if you're buying reads online, you're at the mercy of those read makers, right? And you don't exactly know what you're getting. So if you're ever near Forest Music, I highly recommend you come in and take a look at all the different read makers. We have many different read makers with different styles, different styles for different people. And you can take a look at all those styles and see you know, and kind of start to see the differences. And then when you order reads, you'll have a better idea of like, oh yeah, I kind of like the reads that have shorter tips, or I like the reads that are longer, or, you know, you start getting an idea of what you like. Um, but not everybody has, I don't know where you're all from, but most people don't have forest music in their town or a place like forest music. And a lot of the music stores, you know, don't have a, you know, someone on staff who knows anything about the oboe, not to their fault. Um, but if you do come in and look at reeds, there's a couple things that you should look for. One, the sides of the reed. I'm going to show you this gigantic reed here, which I really love. <laughs> um, the sides of the reed should seal. So if these, right, like, I don't know if you can see it, but this, this, 
you know, read, does not seal on the sides, it's open. And I can kind of force it open to show you like, that's not good because when, and it may close when you soak it, but chances are you're gonna have to use your embouchure to keep that reed sealed, right? So look for closed sides. Look for a reed that has an opening. I like to err in my, yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but I like to err on the side of more open than less open. And the reason is a closed reed, there's not much you can do about it. Whereas an open, a reed that's maybe a little bit too open, there is something that you can do about it. With a knife, with some of the tools that we're talking about today, you can kind of force that reed to close down a little bit. But if the reed's too closed and you can't get sound through the reed, I mean, it's you're just gonna struggle. So those are kind of the things to, oh, and the last thing is to look at the curvature of the blades. So you have, it's obviously a double reed and the curvature comes from the actual piece of cane and um and the diameter of that cane and i'm not going to go into that today but the end result is some reeds have more curvature and some reeds have less curvature so if it's more flat you're going to have a more closed reed the opening is going to be less open um, but the other thing is to have symmetry so that the top blade and the bottom blade both have the same amount of curvature. That's actually really important. So um, even when you're choosing through the bundles of reeds on your desk, you can use this criteria to choose what reed might be better functioning. So, um, and, and as I said, if you're able to come into a store that has a good supply of oval reeds, you can then kind of take a look and say, oh, this one's not so good. I'm not gonna take that one. So, um, after that, there's just a, a couple other things that I have to mention before we even start getting into, this is kind of the nuts and bolts of before we even get into um, uh, adjusting reeds. One is to not over soak your reeds. I see a lot of kids who will throw all, in fact, I just did it here, to be honest. I threw four reeds in for this demonstration purpose and left them sitting in water and that's not good. An over soaked reed isn't gonna function properly. So I like to soak my reeds in a shot glass or Nalgene bottle that has a, you know, a screw lid or a reed soaker that many, that Forrest carries. Um, and I like to soak the reed all the way past the cane to the string, at least a little bit, because cane is underneath that string. So I like to soak the whole piece of cane. Um, and I like using water rather than just soaking it in my mouth. Um, I know that kids, when you're in, when you're in a band, you don't really necessarily have the option of getting water, but there are, um, uh, reed soakers that don't leak and you can keep them in case. Um, if you have a reed that you like and you've been playing on it for a really long time, it's a good idea to clean it out ever so often. <laughs> Um, and so I, the way that I do that is to take a plaque and very carefully insert it and kind of gently, gently, gently clean both blades. And um, another uh, way to do that is to clean your reeds is to rinse them in water before, after you play each time and just blow all the water out, let them dry out completely, which um, kind of leads me to reed cases. <laughs> um, I know there are a lot of reed cases that don't have any ventilation, like no holes. And if reeds don't dry out properly, they, they don't last as long and they might be um, deformed when you get them out and say, wait, this reed looks different than when I put it away. So try to find a reed case that has some ventilation. That's really important. Um, or just leave them on your desk to dry out unless you have a playful cat, like I do. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> um, and then the last kind of nuts and bolts thing is embouchure, the formation of your lips. I can't talk about reed adjustment unless I talk a little bit about embouchure and it's kind of a bigger subject, but if unless the reed is incredibly flat, there is no reason to bite down on the reed. And I don't mean bite down with your teeth, obviously. I'm, I'm no biting down with your lips covering your teeth. So I see a lot of students who will do this and, and really put a lot of pressure on that reed. 
the reed, you are suppressing the vibrations in this reed when you're biting down and you're not allowing the reed to function. And you may be doing that because the reed is too vibrant, right? So that's why you're here is to learn how to maybe get rid of some of that extra vibration so you don't feel like you have to bite. Um, uh, are there any questions at this point? I know I'm kind of talking fast and saying a lot of information just as a precursor to when we're going to start adjusting. Does anybody, does anything not make sense? We okay? So just on the, on the reed cases, could you take a, a sealed case and if you can, you know, drill a couple of holes in it, you know, with like a very small drill, is that good enough? Just, it yeah. just needs to breathe a little, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. What's your, uh, what would be your target? Uh, you say don't soak too, too long, which is something I could certainly, uh, appreciate from having done that. But, uh, what, if you're going to set a little timer to remind yourself to take absolutely. it out. Absolutely. That's actually a good idea. I would say two to three minutes, two to three okay, minutes. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll try that. And sometimes, you know, new reads tend to you know, soak up the water really quickly. And I feel like with older reeds, I, you know, they're less, <laughs> less responsive. And sometimes I feel like I have to soak them a little longer. Everybody's different, but as a general rule, two to three minutes is plenty. But I, I, I do 30, think, yeah, go ahead. So I have a 30,000 foot question, which is you said when you when you have a reed that you play for a long time, what is a long time? Cause I'm, I'm not the player, I'm the parent. <laughs> well, that is a really good question. I have students that say they've been playing on reeds for six weeks, which I would consider an extremely long time. Okay. Um, there, there is another phenomenon of everybody, the enzymes in every, everybody's mouth are different and break down reeds at different rates. My reeds, they last, you know, when I'm really performing, three rehearsals and they're gone. Two and a half hour rehearsals, three of those, boom, the reed's dead, I can tell. But kids are different and, um, you know, maybe they don't practice as much and they don't notice that the reed is disintegrating a little bit. But I would say, man, six weeks is way too long, you know, really. Right. So, so it sounds like maybe six to ten hours is more like it? Well, for kids, it could be a little bit longer. Yeah. Right. But um, I'd say, you know, every two weeks you should really evaluate your reads. Okay. And Thank maybe you. And have more than one. Don't always you know don't always say oh here's my favorite read i'm going to play on it until it's dead and then you know you have to like figure out what to do after that you know every day is different and you should soak up a couple reads every time you play so thank you yeah um so the the next part is tools um uh the, and i'm just going to go through all each one and kind of talk about like what i use um and a little bit of technique is in terms of like the knife, which is the most important important part. So um, I use two different knives, knives, um, and honestly, it doesn't matter what kind of knife you use as long as it's sharp. Um, the Rigotti Devil Hollow Ground is probably the best like standby knife that there is, in my opinion. And you know, people are going to disagree. You know, people have their favorites, and I have a finishing knife that I use, which is a Landwell. It's, you know, a pricey knife, but it works for me. But the double hollow ground um, Rigotti that Forrest carries and many other places carry is, is just a fantastic, solid, good knife. But it doesn't matter what kind of knife you have if it's not sharp. And so um, knife sharpening is something that is just a huge, huge subject. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it down to the simplest for this scenario of adjusting reeds and that is to use a burnishing rod. And um, this is a smooth steel. Um, I know you might have one of these in your kitchen that's really long and has lots of ribs on it and it's a little harsh. I mean, it might be harsh for a reed knife. This is absolutely smooth steel. And it's a fantastic way to finish a knife that's already sharp. And you can use it frequently during your, your reed adjustment sessions. So, um, just a very quick, and I think Forest website has kind of um, a suggestion on how to sharpen with a burnishing rod. I'm going to show you what I do here, which is um, to lay the, the knife flat first, 
raise it up to about 20 degrees and pull towards you a couple times and then a little higher angle at about 30 degrees and go away from you. Can you raise or can you lower your camera angle just a little because it's slightly out of frame? I think. Uh, Allie. <laughs> I might have Allie come up and adjust this and I'm going to continue. Oh, I'll um, come okay. up and adjust it. I'll be right yeah, back. We'll, yeah. I don't want to totally mess things up. So we'll do that while I'm continuing. Okay. Um, and then the knife sharpening thing is a big issue. Um, but I feel like, you know, the burnishing rod is the simplest way to keep a knife sharp. You may have to go to a harder stone ever so often, but I use it throughout my, my uh, reed making. And then um, in order to test your knife, there is a fantastic way to test whether your knife is sharp. And that is on your thumbnail. And I know this looks scary, but I'm dropping the knife on my thumb, kind of at a per perpendicular angle, and I'm pushing the knife forward a little bit. And if the, if the knife grabs my nail, then it's sharp. And you might find that certain places on the knife are not sharp and, you know, which then you'll have to address that issue. But this is, this is just a foolproof way for me to tell whether my knife is sharp. If it skates across my nail, like it doesn't grab, then, um, so you wanna test? Yeah. Is that better? As far as the camera angle? No, it's, it's, the, it's the one you're looking into that's not pointed the right direction. Oh. I don't know. I yep, don't know. that's, you're getting closer. <laughs> yeah? Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I should have both things spin, so you should have the downward angle of the desk and roof and as well. And this. All righty. So um, I don't know how many of you have, you know, worked with knives um, and started this process. So I'm just going to do a kind of a quick, qu quick thing about holding the knife. Um, well, first of all, the reed, I use a mandrel and it's an extension of the reed and it's just gives you something more to hold on to and the reed rests at the first knuckle of my first finger the knife i i um, pivot and turn with my wrist a little bit and use my left thumb to push the knife on the cane um, so the knife generally starts at a perpendicular level and then you push with your left thumb, short strokes. No matter what you're doing, use short strokes. And I like um, not to use any pressure. If you find you're using a lot of pressure, that means your knife is not sharp. And if you're pushing and pushing, it's, it's not good for the cane fibers. And, and so um, it's just really important to have a sharp knife. I'll say that a thousand times. Use short scrapes and finish in the air is another little technique that I like so that you don't end up with nicks. So um, we're going to get more into that in a little bit. Um, but downward pressure is just not something that is, um, is going to be helpful and you're going to make mistakes. So we talked about the mandrel. It's just an extension. You can, you can make reads without a mandrel, but I find my hand gets cramped. And so a mandrel is just an, ex an extension. It gives you more to hold on to. We have plaque, um, plaques. Um, there are two, two, well, there's three kinds, but for our purposes today, we have a flat plaque and a contoured plaque. In general, I would say the flat plaque is what you should use if you're a beginner. The contoured plaque I use for certain areas of the reed. And I would say never do I finish the very end of the reed with a contoured plaque. There are many teachers that won't even introduce a contoured plaque at all, but I find it very useful for certain areas of the reed. I love it. And there's an ebony one, a wood one, and a metal one. I, I use a metal one, but for no good reason. Um, the block, just a standard um, grenadilla wood block. It can be big or small. Mine is teeny. 
I like having a little bit of um, something on the back, you know, uh, this is felt so that it doesn't slide around. Um, razor blade. Um, there's two ways to clip a tip. One is with a knife and one is with a razor blade. I use a razor blade because I feel like I have more control. And my favorite kind of razor blade is a GEM, G-E-M -G razor blade. It is an amazing, <laughs> it's so easy to clip with it. It's just incredibly sharp and you can take the smallest amount of cane off. Um, the last tool is also almost as important as the knife and your knife being sharp enough and that's a good light. A good light so that you um, can look back uh, you can hold the reed up to the light and see a backlit version. And you can kind of look and see, oh, look, I'm not very symmetrical. I need more cane taken off on this side because you want both blades to be the same. So that, um, those are the tools. Um, I'm going to go over quickly the, the main parts of the reed. And I know probably a lot of this is, is you know, you know all of this, but in order for us to talk about where we're going to take cane off, we need to know the different parts of the reed. So this part is the tip. There are different lengths. No, you know, short, long. Generally, it's about five to six millimeters from here to here. But again, no right, no wrong. It's a matter of preference. The very, very end of the tip to me is the most important place on the reed. And um, that needs to be extremely thin as well as in the very corners right here. We'll get into all that later. This is the heart, these, these two sections. In between the tip and the heart is the blend. So if a reed isn't vibrating properly, it very well might be that, the, that this area is too thick and you want to scrape a little bit off that blend to get the vibrations to go through. Um, this area, these are the windows. These are thinner. This area is generally thinner than this area. And of course, you're going to buy reeds that don't follow this diagram. Um, but I feel like some reeds that you get, you'll be able to add, for instance, some windows and it'll improve the sound quality. So, um, uh, yeah. So, You'll see lots of reeds in lots of different styles, so it, it'll be confusing in the beginning, but um, we'll get, get more into that later. The dark areas here on the sides are areas where there is not cane taken out. So this is the spine. I avoid it at all costs, unless a reed just will not vibrate, then I'll take some cane out of here. And I try to avoid the rails. This gives the reed support. Um, if you take too much off the sides, the reed's going to collapse and it'll close down on you. So um, that I'll refer to this in a little while. Any questions about just the general sections of the reed? No? Okay. Um, there are um, four basic criteria of a reed performing well. And so these are the things that you need to think about when you're trying to evaluate your read. One, does it respond? And this is absolutely the most important thing. If the read does not respond, you're going to struggle. You're not going to be able to get that low C out. You're not going to get those low notes out. It's going to, you know, it's just, it's going to be really hard. And you're not going to be able to play quietly um, in the low register in particular. Resistance is another factor, and this is how much air the reed will accept um, and how it accepts that air. It should be possible to play your um, full dynamic range with little embouchure intervention. So you should be able to blow and the reed should be able to play forte without having to do much with your embouchure. I'm, I'm going to later on tell you about a test that I do that will, that will help um, to determine how much air and resistance um, the reed can take. Tone quality is the actual timbre of the reed. That is really a personal taste issue. Some people like brighter reeds. Some people like darker reeds. The American scrape is known for its dark quality. I think that can be 
dangerous to like shoot for this dark quality because a lot of times you end up with a reed that doesn't have any vibrancy and liveliness, right? Um, so that's tone quality. Um, you want, what you want is good balance in the reed. And good, and the last thing is good stability. And that refers to pitch, the pitch t tendency, and whether it can maintain that pitch. So that's another reason why you might get really tired playing on a reed. If it's really wild and the pitch is all over the place, your ear is gonna probably hear it and you're gonna try to adjust and that's gonna make you really, really, really tired. So um, those are the four qualities to think about and I know it's, you know it's a lot of information, but you also have to remember that if you, if you scrape in one area of the reed, it is gonna affect everything else. They're all interrelated. So think before you scrape and keep notes. I, you know, I actually wish I would have done this earlier on where I kept one notebook and every time I did something to a read, I would record the result. And that would have been it's so interesting over the many years that I've been making reads. I mean, I have a sense of it now, but I think it would have saved a lot of time. And just because you take cane out of a read and have this response, it's not always gonna be that way, but still record your results so that you can see some patterns. Okay, so I'm gonna, if you have reads and you wanna kinda do this with me, um, I'm gonna soak up four reads. And these are kind of student, student quality reads or good reads, but, um, and they're in various stages so that you can hear the, the crows, which is when I blow into the reed, it crows, it makes a sound. And um, you can evaluate a certain uh, number of things by the crow. So let's just take this first one. And there are two areas that I crow. I crow at this all the way down to the end um, so that the reed is vibrating all by itself. So I'll put my mouth actually on the string which isn't how you play, right? So I can tell a lot just by that sound. This reed is vibrant. There are lots of pitches. That's a, it could be a little too lively. And, but then I like to put the reed into my mouth as I'm actually playing. actually turning out to be not so bad. Um, I'm not using a lot of embouchure. I'm just using my normal embouchure and blowing. Now I hear two pitches. And in general, I am, uh, me personally, I shoot for two pitches. I shoot for octaves. Octave Cs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, what actual pitch you want the read to be. Um, well, actually, I'll talk about it right now. I think for most people, they're looking for octave Cs. High C, low C. That very much depends on your instrument. It depends on your embouchure, and it depends on how much air you're using. So when I'm working with students, I say a good range is kind of a sharp B up to a C. Works at least for, for me. And then you're allowed to like really use your air. And um, if it's much sharper, at least for me, it doesn't, I end up playing sharp, but you'll run into different opinions about that uh, if you talk to different read makers. And again, it's a matter of personal preference really and what, how you function in the end. Um, okay, so that's one read on the crow. Let's try another one. I'm actually blowing quite hard. This would, you know, I can't play on this read, right? I'm not getting, it's, it's dull, it's not vibrating, it's hard. This read is very hard. It's not, it could be resistant, but it's mainly hard. There's just too much cane. I could, I mean, I can really blow and get, get it to vibrate, but it has a ways to go. So I would, we can talk about what we would do with that read, but it's basically not finished. Hopefully you wouldn't get a read like that in the mail unless you requested it. Okay. 
again, very vibrant. Too much for me. I would have to control that too much. I'm not sure that would be a choice that I would like. Ruth, um, yeah. we have a question here from uh, Brittany. Yeah. She's asking, can you talk about testing for leaks? Do you do that, you do that before you test the crow, correct? Um, very, very good question. I, um, when I'm making my reads, I, I test as soon as I open up the read. But if you're buying reads, the way to test for leaks is to block the bottom of the reed and then suck in. And you should hear a suction sound. And if the reed is really sealing, it'll actually stay closed. I don't, you probably can't hear that, but you should hear a pop. And if the reed leaks, I wouldn't even, I mean, there is beeswax, not beeswax, um, what is it called? Uh, fish skin and also parafilm that you can put around the reed. And if it's a really good reed, I would do that. Like don't throw out a really good reed just because it leaks. If it's a leak at the bottom, you can put parafilm around it or fish skin. And I've done it. I don't like to, but I've done it. <laughs> but good question. Thank you. Okay, so So this reads actually kind of flat, I would say. It's closer, I'd say it's probably closer to a B flat. So I may not, you know, that's a read that I maybe wouldn't wouldn't use. But let's get into um, some tests and um, some tests in the oboe. So let's take that really hard one that I put aside. And this is this is a fantastic test for response. Um, and that is to use hardly any embouchure, very low air pressure, and start to blow into the reed, gaining air pressure until the reed speaks. So you keep blowing, 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 blowing until the reed speaks. And if it honks at you or barks at you like a dog, <laughs> it doesn't have enough response. So I'm going to give you the extremes. So the hard reed, if I test it for a response, it kind of went, <coughs> you know, it just hesitated, hesitated, and then it spoke. That does not have response. Let's take a read that is better. It's almost like it, the sound slides right into the air, you know, like slicing butter almost. It's, and that is what we're looking for. Um, and that will help you to play a low note quietly. That will help you to, when the band director has you play on the downbeat, you're gonna be with him, right? So, so that's when you have good response. When you don't have good response, I should have marked these, what one was what. Here we go. So if I was trying to play this read and, and the band director's giving his downbeat and I have to be with him, it's, it's, you're not gonna be there. You're just not, without a lot of work. And who wants to work that hard? The oboe's hard enough, right? It's hard enough. You wanna make things easy for yourself. So um, the next test that I do um, is, so we crowed at the string just to see how the reed is vibrating. We did the G test just to see how the response is. And now we're gonna do um, some octaves. And um, octaves should, you're gonna play the lower octave and then add your octave key without changing your embouchure and see how flat the upper register is. If it's terribly flat, then you need to do something about your read. If it is only a little bit flat, that will be corrected with your embouchure because when you're playing in the upper register, you're putting a little bit more read in your mouth, usually using a little bit more air. So, so I mean, this read, that I'm probably using I'm using my air just naturally, which I shouldn't, but I can just tell that the octaves are just popping out, that, that it's gonna be very comfortable. 
um, you'll know when you do that. Let's let's do one, let's do a read that where it maybe doesn't really work all that well. Actually, this one's not so bad. I mean, not so bad. The octaves were pretty well in tune, but you will know when it's not. You will absolutely know it, and and know that that's that you have to do some work on that. Um, the third test that I do is <laughs> a little odd, and I'm not sure if anyone else in the world does this, but it works for me. Um, and that's to play out of the side of my side of my mouth, like I'm a flute player. And the reason I do this is if the reed sounds pretty good out of the side of my mouth, then chances are it's going to be pretty easy to play for a long period of time. And, it, and that the reed is just good on its own, right? So out of the side of my mouth, I have no embouchure. There's no, there's, you're not holding on to it in any way. So... <laughs> I mean, that's not so bad. <laughs> I'm not going to play like that, obviously, but um, that's another indication that that particular read is actually not bad. So you might want to do that. Um, you might want to do that with your reads if they, and I'll give you an example um, of one that really isn't going to sound so good. <laughs> You know, that's it's not a finished reed. It's flat. It's raucous. You're going to have to control that reed with your embouchure. No one wants to do that. So those, I have lots of other reed tests, but I just want to kind of keep it a little bit simpler today and just focus on the ones that I use the most. So I think the, the golden rules for reed making are keep your knife sharp, adjust the function of the reed, not the tone. We are so obsessed with tone that sometimes I think we forget that we have to play in tune and we have to have response. If you don't have that stuff, you're not going to sound good, no matter what the tone, right? So adjust the function of the reed, sharpen your knife, and then the last one is don't make mistakes when you're making reeds. Easier said than done. But you'll get better at it if you practice on old reeds. Practice, practice, practice. And don't be afraid. I should actually rephrase that. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because you learn a lot from your mistakes, right? Okay, so let's go through just some common actions, like common things that you would do to a read and what happens when you do that. So the first is to scrape the whole surface. Actually, I want to use my other, my other little read. So, scraping the whole surface of the tip, not read. So, you notice that it's an upside down V. In general, you would be scraping out this way. And tell me if you, if you can see well enough. So, what that does is it gives respo more response. More response. Scraping the very end of the tip all the way across will also give you better response. It'll also lower the resistance. It'll be freer. The reed will be so much freer to play. It also can affect the pitch, but not, but not dramatically. The reed will sound probably a little bit brighter um, and will have a shallower sound if you go too far. Um, it may be slightly flatter in pitch if you scrape all across the tip. If a reed is functioning pretty well, rarely do I scrape the entire tip. If it's playing pretty well, but uh, the response maybe isn't so great, I'll focus on the very end and the very corners up here. I feel like this area right in here is the thinnest place on the entire reed. If you can get that really, really thin without ripping off the corners, which is what will happen in the beginning, it will. <laughs> that gives you a lot of liveliness in the sound. And if you have a lot behind there to back it up, it's, you know, it's going to be a pretty good read. So scraping the sides of the tip often is neglected on many reads that you get online. I feel like 
I'm not sure why exactly, but I feel like this area is generally thicker than it should be. And um, again, it gives you better response, lower resistance, and, and if you focus in this area right here, right where the tip corner is at the bottom, I have a colleague that coins that the magic corners, this area in here can really focus the sound a lot. Um, so, um, sorry, I have my, I don't know how to turn off my texting, I'm sorry. Um, okay, the next thing is the heart. Well, let's see, let's, let's continue with the tip, clipping the tip. So, th before I ever, ever clip, I always thin the end of the tip. If the reed is flat and you need to clip it, that's fine, but you're going to end up with more resistance. And maybe you don't want that. Maybe you just want the pitch to be raised. And in that case, I thin the very end of the tip and then I clip. And I want to just go over, and I hope people can see this. Um, let me just grab one of these reeds here. So I use, I use my gem razor blade, and I think one of the most important things about clipping is to practice getting, not even clipping anything, and then get closer and closer to, and to the point where you're actually clipping the smallest amount that you possibly can. So I will add an angle, take the razor blade, and draw it back, 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 until I see the smallest amount and clip. You may say, oh, my reed's really, really flat. I know I have to clip it a lot. I never do it. I never, ever do it that way. I, I, uh, because you're going to lose so much resistance. Um, I mean, so much uh, response. So practice on old reeds. Are we going to try to turn off my, I didn't want to turn off. Should no. I just put the volume down for my message? You're, you're fine. Okay. Are you adjust adjusting? The camera for, okay. Here. Alrighty. Um, so when you clip, you're just going to end up with more resistance. The pitch is going to be sharper, which you may want, and it also will be more stable. The reed will be more stable. Um, but clip to improve the function of the reed. Don't clip to try to change the sound quality um, in general. Um, so either the reed is sharp, flat, and you want to address that issue. If it's flat, you're going to clip it. All right. So next is the heart. This area here and here, in general, I stay away from the middle. So if you take cane out of the heart, you're, it's going to free the reed up. It's going to, it's going to, you're going to blow into it, and it's going to be a lot easier to play. Easier response, lower resistance, probably a lot brighter. If you have a really, really, really dull reed, I might go into the center of the heart to get it to vibrate and to get it to go. But in general, I avoid it. I avoid um, the center of the heart. And in fact, you can always reserve this area kind of for later. And because the, the tip is the most important thing. I usually work from the top down. I get my tip functioning and then I work from there. Um, the windows here, will warm up the sound. And I'm gonna show you how I work in the windows. I use the very, very, very tip of my knife. There's a little point there and I lift up and kind of, this is the one place where I dig a little bit and take, you can take a fair amount out of the windows and do no harm. If you scrape the sides or the center, you can do harm. But if you really get in there, I hope, um, hope you all can see. Just put the tip, it's a very fine point, like a, the tip of a pen, and you're just getting in there and, and um, taking cane out of the windows. So that will warm up the sound, it will lower the pitch. Um, I love taking cane out of the windows. That's uh, for me, it's kind of the secret place um, that can really give you stability. Um, and I would say that a lot of store-bought reads don't, don't 
use the windows quite as much as, as they could. And I think what they're worried about is the reed being flat. And, it, you know, if you take too much, it will be flat. Um, the last area is the back. So the back constitutes this area here. This is cane, the black part. That's I try to reserve some cane right above the string. That gives the reed strength. It, if you have a very open reed, I would consider taking some cane out there to try to close it down. But in general, it's not really necessary to touch the bark that is left here. So um, I focus kind of in this area. And again, if you take cane out of the back, it's going to warm up the sound. It will lower the pitch and, um, and it can close down the reed. If you find yourself with a really closed reed, I would avoid the back. I just, I wouldn't take any cane out of the back because if your reed's already closed and you take more cane out there, it's just gonna close it down some more. So, um, any questions? I know this is just so much information. <laughs> I think what I'd like to do is kind of demonstrate, I'm gonna put a reed in and demonstrate how I work on the tip because I think that's the most important part. Could and I ask a question? Of course you can. Yeah, um, I kind of missed the uh, heart. What you were saying, it adjusts and where to adjust it. Okay. When you were going down, you had tip, heart, I got the windows in the back, but. Okay, so the heart is is this section in here. Yes. This, the heart truly is like, like the heart in the body. It, it, it is the soul of the reed in a way. It's, it gives the reed um, stability and warmth. If you, t if you take out too much out of the heart, you're gonna have a really loose reed that could be flat. But if there's not enough taken out, it's gonna, you're gonna blow into the reed and, and it's not, the vibrations aren't gonna go anywhere. You can just tell like that one I was crowing on. You blow on it and you blow harder and the vibrations aren't going through the whole reed. And that would be a time where you want to take some cane out of the heart. So that one hard reed, and maybe we'll use that as an example. Okay, so I'm going to soak up the hard reed that needed help and use that as a demonstration reed where I will first um, answer your question about the heart because I do think this reed needs more cane out of the heart. Okay, thank you. So, and if you can see well enough, I hope, I hope, I'm going to also use a lighted plaque. So this, I can hold this up and it will show you a backlit version kind of, of, of the reed. And hopefully this will help. So again, the mandrel, just an extension. The reed I hold in my left hand, if I'm, if you're right-handed, you support the reed with your finger because if you're just scraping on the reed, it's gonna it's gonna bend. So you want to put your finger behind the reed to support it. And in this case, I want to take a little cane out of the heart, avoiding the sides and the center. So I will do I will scrape short scrapes, maybe three or four scrapes, gentle and do it in all four quadrants. What you do to one quadrant, you're probably gonna wanna do to all quadrants unless it's uneven. And you're doing about six millimeter strokes or something like that, quarter of an well, inch or give or take? Of, it's the length of the heart actually. And the length of each reed that you, you're gonna receive as a store-bought reed, they'll have different lengths of heart. Some hearts are really short, some hearts are really long. And it doesn't, you know, it's not right or wrong but it's the length of the heart in the center of each four, of all four quadrants. So I took a little bit out. Let's see how this reed is doing now. This was this really hard reed a second ago. Now I have a low crow. Before I didn't. And so I blow into the reed, the tip vibrates. I blow a little harder, then I get that low crow. So this reed is going to have some depth to it. I'm going to do my G test. Now 
not great. It, it's, it could be better. So here's a good opportunity to work on the tip and kind of talk about what I do. Okay, so the tip is an upside down V. The first action that I'm gonna do to improve the res response is to scrape the very, very end of the tip. It would probably be the equivalent of a quarter of a millimeter. <laughs> um, and so perpendicular to the cane, sometimes I lift a little bit with this finger in order to get contact with the end of the tip. And I'm gonna slowly work my knife off the end of the reed onto the plaque. Flip it around, do the same thing. Noticing where there might be, like I'm seeing a little bit of a heavy spot right here. I'm gonna focus on getting that fixed. And you could tell when you put the plaque in where there are thicker spots by the color of the cane. It'll be a slightly different color and it won't shine through the plaque quite as much. So, that was that's the very end of the tip so now I should have better response I didn't do much so the response is better I'm still not sure this read is what I want but I'm gonna play it and just see what it sounds like So what I hear, and you know, it's going to be easier for me to tell than to tell on Zoom. <laughs> but but what I hear is it's a little bright and sharp, sharp and bright. So coming up with that vocabulary is really important. So you say, okay, I don't like this read. Um, it's yucky. It's you know, doesn't really help you. I think you have to sit back and say, okay, what really, what don't I like about it so that you can fix it? It's really easy to say it's not comfortable, but you have to say, oh, well, you get a little clearer on, on vocabulary, which is hard. It's like describing the sky or something. I don't know. It's so brightness. I feel like this read is bright. One place that I often go to are the magic corners, which I talked about before, which is this area right in here. That will warm up the sound, and I often feel like that area is neglected. I want to take out this other reed so it's not over soaked. I'm going to actually use my contoured plaque because it raises up the cane a little bit better to get into that area. Now I'm not working on the tip because that is hard with a contoured plaque. So I get into those corners And I noticed that this side is actually quite a bit thicker than the other side. So I'm going to focus a little bit more. So generally speaking, when you're making these adjustments, you do, you're, you're striving for symmetry, right? Yes. Striving for symmetry. Absolutely. And I think one other point to mention, some people use jeweler's glasses. I'm actually using just, um, kind of strong readers that magnify the read. And boy, I wish I'd done that a long time ago. It really helps. Um, but the jeweler's glasses, a lot of people use those so you can really see what's going on. So now I have more low sounds in this read. Remember I said it was sharp. Mm, well, now it might be a little bit flat. 
So did I go too far? Maybe not. I'm not really sure yet. I think doing one step at a time and not getting ahead of yourself is also wise. As you get better at read making, you, you start thinking ahead and saying, oh, I think that after this step, I'm going to do this and not a good idea. One step at a time, try the read, right? <laughs> I would go a little bit farther with this. It's still like for me, I don't know what it sounds like to you guys. It sounds bright and, and a little shrill. So I would go back to the drawing board and crow it again. See, I'm getting a little, I'm getting some shrillness in there. And so I would continue trying to balance the tip, thinning the end of the tip a little bit more and, um, and seeing where that takes me. Ruth, I have a question here from Mike. Yep. Uh, he says, mm -hmm. with the magic corners, are you blending the heart down to the corners or defining the back corner of the tip more? I am defining the back corner of the tip. Definitely. There may be times where you go a little bit further and blend more. Like if the reed is horribly sharp, you might want to bring back those corners a little bit more, but in general, I'm going right at that point and defining the tip. Did that answer your question? It did for him. Thank you. Okay, good. Great. So, just talking about sound quality, I pulled out a read that I like a little bit better than the one I was working on, just to discuss sound. like. And, and again, this has been so hard over Zoom talking to my students, you know, it's about sound over Zoom. Whew, really hard. And so I don't know what you can hear and what you can't, but I think you can probably hear a difference between the read I was working on and this read. It's just a warmer, rounder, bigger sound. Um, so that you have to decide what you're shooting for, like freedom, vibrancy. I, in general, I would say that reeds are either too vibrant or not vibrant enough. And if you, that's kind of a simple way to work on reeds. Like it either vibrates too much or not enough. But um, if, and we'll just kind of go over the, the simple parts about it. If a reed is flat, you're going to want to clip it. If it's sharp, you're going to want to take some out of the heart. It could also be that the re if a reed is sharp, it could have too small of an opening. And there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, if a reed is flat, the opening may be too open. But you can do something about a reed that is too open. And that is to make sure it's soaked. And then with the plaque in, you can kind of squeeze the reed at the tip and make your way down the reed a little bit to close it down. And that will that will raise the pitch. Um, I, have, I have a question here for you from Byron. He's yeah. asking, what scrape do you recommend for students who also play flute? What scrape in terms of what um, type of scrape? So do you want vibrancy or, you know, you said there's different styles you can kind of shoot for. So what what do you think the best way you should, what do you think you should aim for for a student? You know, what's, because obviously a, a professional is going to want it scraped much differently. Right. For a student, the most important thing is response. Okay. And pitch. So response, like do that G test. And if it honks at you, you got to do something about the response. Um, you want, a, you want a little bit of vibrancy for sure. Um, if the reed is really, really, really flat or really, really, really sharp, those are the three things. Response and pitch are the two things. Sound quality, you know, it's subjective. But if you blow into the reed and, and you have to control it, it's just, it's really hard for kids. Really hard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? A question. Um, yeah, so 
I have issues with my, it's like more my oboe, but like a lot of the, like, I have troubles like getting the reed in. Do you have like any like suggestions for that? Like it's just the fit of it. Like synthetic cork is usually okay, but it's like the the real stuff that I have a, it's like hit or miss. So even with- Yes. Cork. Oh, I yes, I very much understand. So um, for some reason right now, corks are, are bigger than they have been in the past. Like this didn't used to be an issue. And I believe, and Ellie, correct me, are we selling the compressor? We do. Um, I will okay. drop the link to it in the chat, which is designed to fix this exact problem. And I'll show you how it works. And it is saved. Like, I have students that have gotten their reeds caught in their oval and they can't get them out. And, I, you know, I'm not, it's, it's been an issue. We've tried to address it with the, the reed makers. And um, so our repair technician came up with this which is a modified you know it's a modified um what do you call this <laughs> i can't think what it's called um so you stick it in the cork oops wrong way i always do that and then you just slowly turn and it compresses the cork enough to get it into the instrument the other thing is cork crease make sure you're using cork crease so those two things usually solve the problem. Very good, very handy tool to have if you're buying reeds. And a very good question. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, there's a question here from Tommy that says, I have a reed that has a crack in the middle, but it has the fastest response time out of all of my reeds. What should I do? <laughs> Throw the reed out. <laughs> Sorry. No, that was... You know, if you have a read, if you have a crack in your read and it's visible, it, I can't imagine that it is in tune and it's only going to get worse. So a lot of times you'll see a crack and it just starts to form. And where is the crack? That's another thing to ask. Where is the crack in the read? He says it's in the middle. In the middle of the read, high up or low down? I don't know. Well, I'll, just, I'll just address the issue. So occasionally you'll get a read. And let me use the bigger read. He says from top to bottom. Wow, from top to bottom. If it's a if it's a crack that's starting to happen, the, the cane will start to separate. At a certain point, it's just going to boom, open up. And I, I the read won't play. Um, <laughs> I've actually had a reed start to crack while I'm playing on it and, and and the pitch just starts to go down, down, down and you're like, what's happening? <laughs> and you look at your reed and you're like, oh, it's cracked. So I can't imagine, I mean, you can use it as a practice reed and, and as an experiment and you'll see what happens. Occasionally you'll get a crack down here in the bark. That is usually okay. Just a tiny little crack. Almost, I mean, I would say 99% of the time that crack doesn't go any further. So don't worry about that crack. Very good question though. Any other questions? Marielle had a question. Yes, ma'am. Says, can you go over which scrapes are good for flatness, sharpness, and response in the order of scrapes you try? Okay, so flatness, sharpness, was that it? And response. And response. Let's start with response, because I that's my my thing. Um, having to read the response, I would do the G test for response. I would do that G test where you blow with not much air, increase your air, and then you'll get an idea of how much cane needs to come off. And I would scrape the very 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 end of the read. The other place that might help with that is the blend, which we haven't actually talked too much about. But this area between the tip and the heart is the blend. If you lightly scrape here, that can improve the response a little bit. So those two areas um, will help a lot with, um, with response. If a reed is flat, like noticeably flat, I thin the end of the tip and clip almost always. 
There's not a whole lot else you can do other than is the reed too open? If it's like really, really, really open, I would do the, the technique that I was talking about, put the plaque in with a soaked reed and pinch it to try to close it. And that will bring the pitch up. If a reed is sharp, it actually could be that the tip is too thick and the reed's just not vibrating. So I will start from the top and work my way down. Um, I make sure I have response. If I have response and the reed is still sharp, I'm gonna go into the blend or the heart or the back, depending on the quality of the sound. If, if the sound is sharp and bright, I'll take a little bit out of the heart and really get into the windows and really dig out the windows. Is that helping? Okay, good. Any other questions? So I think I was, I have some kind of overall general thoughts about adjusting reads, which um, I will, there, it's a little bit of a summary kind of of what we talked about. Um, and Real quick, there was, there was one huh? other question. There was one other question oh, yeah. Please. Uh, from, Br from Brittany that says, what's the difference between pro reads and student reads? Oh, very good question. Very good question. Um, student reads in general are gonna be a little bit more vibrant, a little easier to play with less resistance. But honestly, it's very, I mean, yes, pro reads are pro reads. Somebody's really handmade those reads, really put a lot of attention into them, and they're going to be $30 a piece probably, right? Student reads are going to be a little bit, should be a little bit out of the box, easier to play for students who are learning, who don't have strong embouchures. I find that's not always the case. So I don't think there's a student that comes into my studio where I don't do a little bit of tweaking of their reads to give it, you know, a little bit more response. But in general, I would say the pro reads are gonna have more resistance, a little bit more to blow against, and a little bit like bigger sound, bigger, rounder sound. Very good question though. All right, I have one more quick question. Um, yeah, please. Do, uh, do shapes, like, okay, so I'm a bassoon player by like, like that's where I play both oboe and bassoon, but I have training on remaking only on bassoon. Um, the shapes like matter a lot for us. Is that like a thing for oboe as well or not as much? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. absolutely, it's a huge, it's a huge difference in sound quality. And the shape for those of you who don't know is the width from, from across at the various points of the reed. So you can have kind of a reed that flares a little bit more. You can have a reed that's, wide at the top, skinny at the bottom, and each of those shapes will give you a different sound quality. And um, if you learn to make reeds, you can, you can explore all those different shapes and see what you like. But yes, it does matter. And so if you're, if you're coming to forest and you're looking at all the reeds, you can see that this, you can see some that are skinnier, some that are a little wider. And in general, the wider shapes are gonna give you a little bit of a warmer sound, a darker sound, and the skinnier shapes are gonna be a little more vibrant and a little lighter, not in a bad way, but a little more flexible and a little bit more lively in the high register. So it matters a lot. Um, Do um, like student reads tend to be, tend to air on like the thicker or thinner side or? They tend to err on the thinner side. There are usually strengths, which I'm sure you found. Soft, medium, and hard are, ge are the general strengths. Right, I meant um, like, the, like at the tip. That was like poorly worded. Like the size of oh, the, at the top of, for the shape. If it's like for wider. The shape, or thinner, oh, yeah. wider or thinner. Or like narrower, yeah. I would say the student reads are probably a little bit narrower at the tip overall. If you have a really wide shape, you're fighting with possibly being flat. I mean, if it, I know people that play in really, really wide shapes. And for me, I have to struggle with playing up to pitch on a shape like that. 
And you wouldn't want to give a student a read like that because they're learning <laughs> and it's just too hard. So I would say in general, it's thinner at the tip. Thank you. Narrower. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, thanks. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from Mike that says, sometimes I shred the corners a little bit, but the read seems to still play for me. Is it a bad habit for me to play on these reads with shredded corners? That's a really, really, really good question. I'll, I'll commend you in that if you're starting to shred the corners, that means you're actually getting close to thin enough. And um, I would say that when I'm finishing my reads, I tend to get to the point where I am shredding the end a little bit, but then I will do a final clip that will get rid of that shreddedness. And it's minor, but it also tells me, it tells me that I'm getting thin enough. So if you, if the read plays, that's the proof's in the pudding, right? If the read plays, it's not a problem, but I wouldn't make a habit of it because I feel like there just might be too much resistance if you have a read that's kind of shredded. Um, occasionally, if I shred, let me get my bigger read out. If I shred, and I, I assume you're talking about up here, it's so easy to lose these corners, so easy. Um, so if you start to shred these corners and it's fairly substantial, you actually can clip away a, just a small amount off the corners. And it kind of, what it does is it kind of brings the tip in a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've actually done that many, many times. So it can, it can actually be a technique. Um, but I, I maybe stop just a little bit before you start shredding. And this actually brings up an issue of a micrometer. And I'm not recommending you go out and buy a fancy micrometer but I do use it to kind of test the waters of where I am with a read. Like how, like, especially if I'm off target and I don't know why, I'll start measuring my reads and say, oh, okay, I see what's happening here. My tips are just not thin enough, right? So I'll use a micrometer sometimes um, to kind of say, okay, the corners of my tip are at 0 0.02 millimeters, fantastic, you know, yay, I did it. <laughs> um, or they're just too thick and I need to work on them a little bit more. So that was a long-winded answer, I would say. <laughs> Any more? Happy to answer. <laughs> so you were saying earlier that really the most important thing is a sharp knife. Yep. And, um, what I have read about it is that, and I think you demonstrated this too, where you ran it across the steel or the, the burnish, the, the burnishing tool. And essentially you are taking that edge and um, rolling it so that you now have um, the edges folded a little. And that's what does the scraping, right? You don't actually yeah. have a slicing edge. You have a scraping edge where it's right. it's more like this and not, yep. not that, right? Yeah. And it's minuscule. So, and you can... Yeah. It. You, you can, can feel, feel it with your face. You can catch it, right? Yeah, you can yep. actually definitely feel it, and it's it's that's a technique. Like if you're using a sharpening stone, you'll really feel it on a, on a heavier duty sharpening stone. You'll feel that that bend. Um, right. The burr. They call it a burr. The burr. That's that's the word I was trying to come up with. It it yeah, failed yeah. me there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. And so that that is when you're sharpening on a stone, you will feel that that burr and you want to feel it all the way down the knife to make sure that you're getting it even. Right. But I, you know, I just, I found that the burnishing rod is such a useful tool, especially for players that haven't, haven't worked on reeds all that much. Cause I feel like you can't harm your knife as easily because I think if you're using a stone, that's a little, a harder stone, you can really hurt your knife and if, you know, if it's a $40 knife and you have to regrind it all the time, there's not going to be much left to it. So, yep. this is so I was going to ask, um, in, instead of that burnishing tool, uh, I have a really nice uh, sharpening kit for kitchen knives and it has a ceramic steel. Oh, so yeah. It's perfectly smooth. And, yeah. and it takes those kitchen knives and puts a, a crazy edge on it. So I'm assuming it would be yeah. okay to burr over with that. 
I would think so. There, there are ceramic sticks that were popular and some people still use them. There are ceramic mm -hmm. sticks that they put in a little base and, yep. and just go boom, boom, boom. And I've seen those, those too. Yep. work really great. Leather okay. straps people use. Um, I have, you know, a whole drawer full of <laughs> different ways of sharpening knives. And, right. you, and again, it's trial and error. And, you know, some people are really good at sharpening knives and some people aren't. And um, I, I, I'm not, I, I just have found what works for me. And that is the burnishing rod. And then occasionally I'll go to a, a diamond stone, but a rarely, rarely do I have to use this. And it's a pretty yeah, rough diamonds of Diamonds a pretty coarse way to grind to, you know, the, the water stones and other things like that are, are much gentler on the edge than a diamond. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I probably come at this once every, couple months or something yeah you know, i really don't have to use it very often and my knives last yeah. fairly long so yeah sharpen your knife i mean i can't i i cannot reiterate this enough if you try to work on reeds with a knife that's not sharp you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you're not going to be able to take the cane off you know and if you try to work on your tip you're just going to rip it and also Sharpening your knife, not just before you start, but frequently, especially when you're working on the tip, get in there and use this more often than you think you have to. Test your knife a lot. Make sure that it's grabbing. Um, yeah. I think Marielle has a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm looking, I dug through all of my old reads to try and find reads that I thought were somewhat problematic. Um, and one of them that I found, it came when I purchased it, it had those clipped corners. Um, the thing that I was always confused about, I'm not sure if you can see, but the the blades don't seem to line up. And so they are kind of to the side. So they have these kind of wings hanging off the edge. Uh -huh. And the way they're clipped, then it's clipped in that position. If you try and squeeze it, then the clip kind of mismatches on the top. Is that a read that you should just end up checking out or is there something salvageable to it you know it could be salvageable in general i don't throw <laughs> i don't throw out very many reads um because of that kind of thing i mean if there's a chip in the middle of the tip and it's large you know i'm going to chuck it but i might even try to clip it away you know but this brings up that most reads are slipped so you're not talking just slipped blades. You're talking more than that, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a little bit slipped. And like, usually when it's slipped, you know, it's still sealed on the sides, which is fine. But then while it's slipped, it's also clipped on the corners. Right. So it's just kind of the combination of the two. And then if you try to squeeze the corners a little bit to make that slip just a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. then the kind of like right angle because it didn't actually get clipped on that corner that right angle comes over to where the clip side is and it's kind Got of it. just an awkward sometimes you can take a razor blade and kind of narrow get rid of the parts that are overly slipped or slipped in the wrong place you'll okay. end up with a, a, a reed that's narrower but that's not necessarily a bad thing and you might salvage the reed um, so yeah, sometimes if the blades are like completely sl like sl slipped blades are there so that your reed will seal. So okay. they nestle, the two blades nestle together so that your reed will seal. Sometimes those blades will slip even more than they should. And rather than throw the reed out, I might try to narrow with a razor blade the, the excess. And then you end up with a kind of a narrow reed, but you may you might end up with a practice read right you know so don't I, I mean i kind of feel like experiment with the reads that aren't working and see what happens you know it may be that the read's not going to work but try you know you get better at you know you know try something take notes you know thank you yeah more So while you're thinking, um, I just want to, I just have like uh, general things to remember. 
that are so important, at least for me. And I'll say it again, a sharp knife. <laughs> um, never deliberately remove cane from the center of the reed. And um, unless you have to, when you're working on a reed, cane comes out of the center and the sides, whether you want to or not, inadvertently, right? So you're working on it and you just, sometimes you just can't control every little scrape. So cane does come out of the center of the reed. Um, you can always take more cane off, but you can't put it back. And so if you keep a lot of cane in the center, you're gonna have more structure. You're gonna have more stability. If you remove the cane from the center of the reed, the reed's gonna be wild. Of course, if the reed is dull and woody, yeah, take cane out of the center. But rarely would I say that that is an issue. Um, when in doubt, adjust the function of reed, not the sound. Just really think about response and pitch, response and pitch. You're gonna sound better on a reed that you're comfortable with. And I wish I would have learned that a long time ago. So you don't, the, t the sound is not perfect. The oboe player is gonna notice no one else is. <laughs> Some people will, I mean, in general, yes. But if you're able to relax and play music, they're gonna notice that a lot more than whether it's a little bit bright or a little bit, you know. Um, make the extreme tip, the corners and the sides as thin as you can. That's the response and the liveliness that you need. Um, think before you scrape. I think once you get going, it, it's easy to say, oh, I think I need to do this, 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 this. Think before you scrape. Just think, what's going to happen if I take cane out? What is going to happen? And everything you do is a compromise. So it's like, okay, my reed is sharp. I'm going to take cane out of the heart. Well, what happens is then the reed sounds a little possibly brighter. So you lowered the pitch, but you made it brighter. Okay, well, you got to decide. <laughs> what's most important. And in this case, having a read that plays in tune is, is obviously better. Unless you're completely sure of what you're, you're doing, um, consider the effects of what you're doing on the four criteria that we were talking about earlier. The response, the resistance, the stability, all of that stuff. Um, as you're working on reads, try them out. Don't just, I mean, I, I do this myself sometime when I'm, you know, my reads are dry now, but I'll like do something to my read and then I'll go, oh, it's good. Yay. <laughs> it's free. It feels good. That's not trying the read. You got to really try it. Have a piece of music on your stand, move your chair away from the read desk and play and really play. Play a scale, play something that's articulated, play some octaves, play something in the high register for a good while. The read's going to change when you put it away anyway. So if you can kind of break it in and see what it's really doing, um, that will be, that will really help. And you might actually find that you like it better than you think. Um, so try the read after every single operation that you do and see, see what happened. And um, the last is to learn to clip the tiniest amount off the reed that you can with that razor blade just really getting in there and just min like like you were talking about shredding the tip well just take a little bit of that shred off you know and learn to be able to do that and um it's so helpful so helpful okay any other questions there is one here from Brittany. How do you balance read adjustments and practicing? Mm. Boy, is that a good question. Well, for me, the times when I've been most successful with that balance is when I work on reads every day for a small amount of time. So I will come in, like let's say I didn't have two kids at home and <laughs> had all the time in the world. I would come in and work on and have an assembly line going at all times and never stop working on reads. But don't sit and work on them for hours and hours and hours thinking you're gonna find the perfect read. I've done that. I've done that a lot, you know, where you just are working till the bitter end of that read. Work on reads in stages, let them dry out. 
You need to be able to make a read really quickly if you're desperate, but in general, I would say come in, work on reads for a half an hour, and then practice. And then come in the next day, half an hour, practice. Because you can really go down, as I've said, that rabbit hole of just thinking that finding the perfect read is going to solve all your problems. But if you're not practicing and you're not in shape, you can't even tell like what's really going on. So I try to work on reads when I'm clear. Like I can practice when I'm more tired, but I can't work on reads when I'm tired. So I try to do it first thing when I'm really clear. Like if I have a big set of concerts coming up, I will first thing I'll do is come in and work on my reads. At what point do you decide if something needs more practice or a read adjustment? How do you prioritize? Very, very good question. Um, well, the read might not be finished or broken in. I think that's one mistake that people make is that they take their reads too far and then practice on them when sometimes it's best to stop just before the read is finished and try to break it in while you're practicing. Maybe tweaking it a little bit as you go but not too much and let it dry out, pull it out the next day, maybe do one tiny thing, but don't do too many things at once. So um, did I answer that question? I'm not sure I really did. Yeah, I, I, think have I have a, a problem where like, if I'm working on like my etudes, like I will just like do a little bit of a scrape, go back to practicing my etude, do a little bit more of a scrape. And then it's just like, it's like the read is just always being worked on, it feels like sometimes, um, in combination with my practice. Got it. I'm not sure if that's like the best kind of thing or if I should just like spend 30, like decide before I sit down if it's gonna be like a read session or a practice session, if that makes sense. No, I think, I, I, I understand what you're saying. And, and, and there are times when you're gonna have to do that. Like, you know, work on your eighteen. and you're like, oh my gosh, this is just too tiring. I need to, I need to work on this read. Or, oh, the response really isn't good enough. But at a certain point, I think it's more important to know your read and know how to adjust, how to adjust to it rather than constantly like saying, I'm gonna make this read perfect. Cause there will be diminishing returns at a certain point. You know, at a certain point, you're going to do something that where you just go too far. So I would say get used to the, like I tend to have a set of reads in my case with, that are finished and I'll play on them and, and just know what they're about. You know, I'll break them in and just say, I, you know, okay, the sound isn't a hundred percent what I like, but I can play on it and I'm going to just leave, leave well enough alone and go practice your etude. And have a set of reads for practice too. You know, the ones that, you know, you maybe wouldn't bring to a concert. You know, they're a little brighter or they're a little, you know, loose. So yeah, I mean, I do think that you have to get, you have to accept what you have sometimes and get used to them. Between like concerts and rehearsals and stuff, like I usually have like six, six to 10 going. Is that kind of normal between like breaking yes. them in, still adjusting? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I would say I have six to 10 at, at, like when I'm really playing a lot, I have six to 10 reads. Yeah, for sure. And then some in different stages of beginning too, you know, at, on the read desk. I think the worst thing is, is, is making a read when you really need it. When you really need a read, you're kind of desperate and you have that like, oh my God, I need a read. And, um, I mean, now we're talking more about read making, but you want to <laughs> stay ahead of the game. Good information, too much, too little. <laughs> All right, then. Happy day. Does anyone else have any other questions for Ruth? We're coming up on the hour and a half mark here. I didn't know if we had a time limit or, limit or not. Actually. We, we had set roughly two hours for this, but if, oh. and, uh, if no one else has any other questions, what I will do is 
there, this uh, session has been recorded. It'll go up on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. I will send everyone an email at that point with the recording, whether or not you guys were here, um, mm -hmm. along with a, a document that has all of the links to the various equipment and references that Ruth has talked about today, um, along with her contact info. So if you want to schedule lessons with her or just want to get a hold of her, I will um, make sure that you guys can get a hold of her for future read making or read adjusting questions. Thank you guys. Yeah, I, yeah I, I'm now adept at <laughs> teaching on Zoom, which I certainly wasn't before. And you know, it, it's worked. And um, so feel free to contact me. And, uh, you know, especially if you just like want to go back and forth on, you know, like spend an hour just talking about reads and like, what do I do here? And, you know, happy to do it. It's a it's it's a very hard process. And it is so stay at it. <laughs> thank you everyone so very much and we hope you have a great rest of your day thank you guys so much for coming bye-bye thanks